Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's now 10 or 3, so I think uh, most people have, uh, have joined in. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to welcome you at this uh, uh, first um, uh, course of the uh, first module of the Bread Development Economics course. I hope you enjoyed uh, Mark Rosenzweig's lectures, and I, this, I hope you will generally enjoy the program that we put together for you uh, over the next few days. We try to align a stellar set of lecturers from different methodologies, different topics, different horizons, different countries. And uh, to give you a sense of, you know, what are people excited about uh, when discussing um, education in uh, developing countries. So I think uh, um, Mark probably spent quite a bit of time discussing uh, the demand side of education and why people um, uh, need, uh, you know, might want uh, or not uh, want to uh, get educated and how that varies with the economic environment. But of course, education doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens for the most part in schools, uh, although we've seen a lot of education happening outside of schools in, uh, during the pandemic. Um, and therefore, and it is largely uh, provided by uh, organized actors, uh, the government or the private school markets. Therefore, uh, it is really impossible to think about education without thinking about the supply side as well. And a lot of what we are going to do in the next many lectures is to discuss precisely that, which is how, uh, what do we know about uh, schools, about how they function, about why they are the way they are. And my lecture today is really just a broad overview, maybe a way to whet your appetite what's, for what's coming next uh, in the supply side of education. So you might find it all a little bit, uh, uh, you know, too fast, uh, but you will, uh, it will all make sense when it, uh, um, when you see all of the lecturers in the next, in the next few, um, in the next few uh, lectures. So, of course, as you all know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has been a, a complete tsunami uh, on the education system in developing countries. Uh, during the pandemic, 300 million children and counting have been affected by school closures. And in many countries, schools took over a year to reopen. And uh, then in some instances, like for example, in the Philippines or in West Bengal, closed again immediately after they reopened in January because of the Omicron wave. Uh, in many places in developing countries, even more so than in the developed countries, schools have been the first to cl close and the last to reopen. And from what we know, although we, the picture is, is, is just in the process of emerging, this had catastrophic impact of learning levels. Uh, here's some, a snapshot of, of data we know from, from India, looking at uh, learning levels uh, of a large sample of children in the state of Karnataka. Uh, this is uh, 18,000 children. Uh, this survey is done in people's homes, so it's unrelated to their um, being in the school or not. And what you're seeing is that in 2018, the, the, the learning levels were not spectacular. We'll go back to that. Uh, but for example, for math, 70% um, um, of kids in, in, in Standard 1 were able to recognize at least numbers. Uh, and uh, uh, going from one to nine, and um, uh, including 30% who were able to recognize the larger numbers. And then by the time they are reaching standard uh, four, for example, 12% uh, could divide, 29% could subtract, and 48% uh, could recognize uh, double digit numbers. In 2021, uh, during the pandemic, uh, but after a few months of the pandemic, going back to the standard one children, uh, only 20% of them can recognize the double digit number. The standard four uh, children, now only 3% of them can do a division. Uh, so almost a division by 10. Uh, only 25% of them also can do a subtraction, almost a division by two. Uh, and most of them find themselves at the uh, digit recognition numbers. Uh, this, um, uh, the, the same thing can be said very much about reading level. Uh, if we're looking, for example, at uh, standard five reading levels, uh, in 2018, only 46% of kids could read a standard two uh, level text 
But in 2021, only 34% of them could read a standard two uh, level text. So uh, there ha really has been a huge drop in, in the learning of the kids during the pandemic, perhaps not surprisingly. Uh, but what is important to note is that uh, this was not, this didn't happen in a vacuum. The pandemic was not something that destroyed an otherwise well-functioning, well-oiled system. This exacerbated uh, existing trends in education in developing countries where we are seeing high enrollment rates, but low attendance and low learning level. So let me show you some data about uh, these three things. Uh, this is just data from India taken from the same ASER survey that uh, the organization Pratam runs by going to, to a, a large number of villages, uh, getting a, sum, uh, a random sample of schools and, and, run, and a random sample of kids, both to measure uh, school participation and learnings. Uh, a key finding is most kids are going to school in India, although they are absent a lot. So in 2014, this is uh, uh, you know, several years ago already, uh, almost 97% of kids in the age group 6 to 14 were enrolled in school in rural India. This was the sixth year in a row, and until the pandemic, it remained true, where enrollment rate had been above 96%. Attendance is lower. A visit to a government school on any random day in September, October, or November shows 71% of the enrolled kids are attending school on that day. Uh, that varies a lot from year to year. You can see the northern states having very low attendance, uh, while the southern states have very high attendance. Uh, the, the picture is, is not unique to India. Uh, if we're looking at the share of uh, primary school uh, age who are in school in 2010, uh, for country uh, for which we have data from our world in, in, in data website, you're finding that you know a lot of the map is blue or even dark blue. A lot of kids are atten uh, enrolled in school uh, um, around the world, and the attendance is pretty low as well around, around the world, with in particular, you can see here the country in Western uh, Africa uh, with fairly low attendance level comparable to what we're finding in Bihar. In general, uh, one thing that really definitely has happened over the last few decades around the world is um, um, investment in the infrastructure. Uh, schools have been built, and when school is closer, people go. So I think people uh, in in Mark's lecture, you you had the opportunity to see that when there are when there is a reason to get educated, for example, uh, when the returns to education are larger, people are are, 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 are tend to stay in school longer. Uh, but like symmetrically, when the cost to education is is higher, people are less likely to go. And when schools come closer to them, either because they have been built right in their village or because they have now transportation to go, they are more likely to go. So here I'm showing you some data from a paper of mine uh, dating from 2001, which is really exploring one of these mass massive uh, school construction investment that took place in Indonesia in the following the oil shock, which for Indonesia was actually uh, a positive shock since Indonesia is an oil producing country. And a lot of the money from the oil shock in Indonesia uh, was used to build schools. And in particular, it was used to build schools in uh, regions where enrollment rates were low. Uh, there was a program called INPRESS, or President Instruction of the Presidents, that basically set up uh, how schools uh, funded with the oil money needed to be allocated. This was done before the oil shock, so before they anticipated this to be a very large program. But then when the old shock came, they had much more money under the program to run schools and they continued the same allocation share. The result is that if we look at uh, uh, um, adults uh, in the 1990s, which is when I, uh, I had the data for, uh, that grew up uh, before or after the program, uh, the, 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 kid, the, the people who grew up when the program was not there before have lower education level in uh, high program region than in low program region. You can see here that the uh, uh, older people um, age in 1974, the people who are already too old to be in primary school, are less likely to uh, have lower years of education than people who, uh, who were in the low program region, simply because the school had not been, been built yet and they targeted the schools to places where enrollment rate had been low to start with. 
Now, if we look at kids who were young enough to attend this school, there is still a difference. Uh, the kids in the high enrollment regions uh, still have less education than the kids in the low enrollment regions, but dif this difference is now smaller. And uh, so there has been a catch up, uh, which can be uh, attributed to the schools to the extent that there was no other differential trends affecting these regions. And one way in which we can confirm that this is really the impact of the schools and nothing else is to look at the impact cohort by cohort of getting more schools built in new region of birth. And so what you see here in each of these graphs is basically what's the impact of having more schools built in new regions for children who were uh, 24 in 1974, they are the benchmark, 23, 22, etc. And what we're seeing is that for kids who were 12 or older in 1974, they don't benefit from any of these schools. But for compared to the, the, the kids who, uh, the older kids in the sample, 1974, but for kids who were born uh, uh, later, so that they were 11, 10, 9, 7, etc., up till 2 in 1974, when all these schools were built, the younger they were at the onset of the program, the more they benefit. And that particular pattern where the impact starts exactly at 12 uh, lines up very nicely with the fact that uh, primary school goes till 12 uh, in Indonesia. So this was uh, fairly strong evidence that uh, uh, schools, just having schools led to an increase in school participation. So parents are basically you know, on board with the program and if they can't send their, schools, their kids to school, if it becomes cheaper, they do it. More recently, uh, Lee Linden looked at a very uh, uh, interesting program of building schools in villages in Afghanistan. This was actually coming from an RCT. And interestingly, this was you know, pre-Taliban uh, re uh, resurgence, uh, he actually found the largest effect on girls, uh, showing that even in Afghanistan, there was actually a demand for girls' education if they could go to the schools safely. And uh, Kartik Moralidan and Ishit Pratash have an interesting paper looking at another way in which you make school clo uh, closer is by giving people transportation to go there. Uh, the state of Bihar in India distributed many, 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 many cycles to girls to allow them to cycle to uh, secondary school. And they found a very large impact there uh, using pretty similar methods as the Indonesia paper to, to, to look at the the impact uh, you exploiting the, the timing of where the program was introduced in various places. So all that to say that we have parents who basically are willing to send kids to whatever schools is available, but the, the key uh, facts that was uh, also present in the, in the data that I showed you uh, for pre and post pandemic is that even pre pandemic, they weren't learning very much. So if you remember in Karnataka in 2018, less than half the kids in standard five could read at the standard two level. And this is something that's not unique either to Karnataka or to that year. I'm showing you here data from 2011, 2016 for all of rural India. And basically this is pretty constant that uh, achievement level in terms of ability to read at the basic level uh, are, are quite low in India. Uh, for mathematics, is, if anything, it's even worse. So uh, this is the ASSER tool for mathematics, looking at uh, second di uh, two-digit subtraction. Only half of the kids in standard five can do this two-digit subtraction with carryover. Uh, only 26% of them can do a simple division. And in fact, only less than half of the kids in standard eight can do this simple division. So it doesn't seem that the schools are, are bringing the kids to, to grade level. Uh, whatsoever. Uh, again, so that you don't think that it's just an Indian phenomenon and this uh, uh, average uh, learning outcome. Uh, these are data taken from a, a, a database that uh, the World Bank, a World Bank team uh, put together uh, with uh, uh, Noam Angrist, uh, Harry Patrinus and Penny Goldberg. And what you can see is that um, the uh, the average uh, learning outcome are quite correlated with GDP, uh, are quite low in Africa, for example, uh, if, uh, in, in particular in these countries that are you know, on the bottom, bottom corner here that are both poor and very low uh, uh, learning levels. Um, despite the fact that, as I showed you before, most of these kids 
are in school. So this suggests that there is a really a real problem of the quality of being sent in the school. Uh, so let me stop here for a minute and uh, uh, and ask for questions before I actually continue to depress you with with even more that the schools are missing. Um, hi Esther. So we have a question from Tier Bhattacharya. And um, they're asking, do you see low attendance in India during harvesting seasons in particular? Also, some states allow students to automatically go to the next grade in India. Do you see this as a reason behind high enrollment and low learning? And then just a second question from Niranjana asking about the source of the numbers uh, regarding learning levels in Karnataka. Um, I'll leave those two for now. Yeah. So the, the data from Karnataka comes from the ASER survey by Pratam, and in particular, an extra one that they did in the middle of the pandemic. They also have another state that they uh, that they have conducted. They were able to conduct ASER only for these two states. Um, the uh, the question on harvest is interesting. You know, in fact, that's actually it's probably true to to a very limited extent. But the fact is kids are missing school for any number of reasons and sometimes for no reason whatsoever. Uh, and, that, and in a lot of cases, kids are actually not doing something while they're in school. They're just missing school, um, either because they don't feel well, that's like an issue, or because they, they don't want to go. And in fact, there is data from Brazil showing that uh, parents have usually no idea where their schools, where the kids are when they are not in schools and have a high demand for uh, information that help them to, to trace their, their children. Uh, the questions on automatic promotion is very good, and we'll, we'll get back to that. I mean, all the questions were very good, but that question is particularly pertinent because I don't know if it contributes to the higher retention, but it certainly contributes to the, to the low learning. The combination of automatic promotion and no attention to, to actually uh, uh, what kids are learning when they are in the schools. Um, so that's uh, so we'll definitely go back to uh, to this point later. So so first of all, schools therefore seem to so parents seems to be kind of on board with the whole education project. Uh, a lot of the schools are enrolled at least uh, to to primary and post immediate post primary, but schools seems to be uh, uh, schools seem to be failing the kids in the sense that they don't deliver much when they are on. They deliver something because it's worse for the kids not to be in school than to be in school, as we saw from the Karnataka data. But the schools actually do worse than not teaching. Uh, and this is something that, uh, that the schools are not teaching, I think is a well-known, uh, uh, well-established fact by now that they at least don't teach as much as they uh, we hope they would. Um, they teach a little bit of something, but no, you know, not as much as we hoped. But uh, something that I've realized maybe in more recent years is that uh, the problem goes deeper and that school not only don't produce much learning, but they're also missing a lot of, of learning that's actually around. And I'll show you two examples of that. That comes from my recent research, uh, in particular with Liz Spelke, a cognitive psychologist uh, at Harvard, uh, who is specialist in uh, how kids learn about mathematics. The first one is at the preschool level, we show that uh, it is quite easy actually to improve uh, uh, intuitive mathematics in preschool. Uh, but even though kids are understanding mathematics much better when they gra reach grade one, uh, um, they, that doesn't help them do better in, in math in grade one. Uh, and that it probably has something to do with the fact that the schools didn't leverage uh, this extra mathematical skill that the kids come with. The second is that uh, going to the other extreme is looking at adolescents. Uh, we have, I'm going to show you data from a project where we follow uh, um, kids who are working in markets and show that these kids can do very complicated mental arithmetics and cannot do school arithmetics and vice versa. Kids that can do school arithmetic very well could not exp uh, do it in markets. So let me spend a little bit of time on both of these uh, project. 
Uh, the first one is this idea of preschool mathematicians. So it's an experiment we conducted. The first experiment, there are three experiments in succession. The first one was conducted with uh, 1,500 four to five-year-olds in uh, Pratam Run Preschool in, in Delhi. So this is like a very informal preschool. You can see this just the classes held on someone's balcony. The classes were randomized to three conditions. In one condition, they played games, in math games. In one condition was an active control that was social games. In one condition, nothing in particular was done. The study uh, took uh, uh, 12 months. First, we did pretest assessment, and we had a curriculum for three months of playing the games, progressive math games. And then at the end, uh, there was a, a first post-test assessment. Then f uh, after that, in next years, we, we continued following the kids. And in fact, we, we are just completing an analysis of what happened to them several years later. This uh, program, these games were uh, um, uh, predicated on the idea that um, um, there is a lot of uh, intuitive knowledge that humans have bearing extreme disability. It has nothing to do with, uh, with them knowing uh, the convention of formal mathematics. For example, uh, kids can know a at a very early age, are able to distinguish that there are more dots in one card and more, uh, in the red card than in the blue card. Uh, so in these games, they're training these abilities. Uh, this one is... Uh, and then when they turn the card, they, so they, they, they can confirm whether they were right or not. And then they also have a chance to see it in a formal way with this uh, bar chart. Uh, similarly, kids are able to distinguish, to have some notion of geometry without having never done any geometry. For example, they are able to uh, look at, uh, uh, tell you that uh, one shape here is different. Uh, it's not this one, so you don't get a smiley, but it's this one, so you get a smiley. And that, again, can be trained by playing several uh, decks of this card. Uh, what we did know uh, from uh, research in cognitive psychology is two things. First of all, this non this intuitive knowledge of mathematics, although it's innate, can be trained. And the second thing we knew is that people who have a greater uh, uh, intuitive understanding of mathematics at a young age do better in life through uh, in math throughout their career. What they did not know is whether or not this is causal in the sense that this is because they are better at intuitive mathematics that they are able to learn formal mathematics better, or it is uh, uh, just an association, which is people who are good at math are just good at math across the board. So our experiment was designed to test that. But of course, we also introduced this, this new concept to the schools that were generally run in a very informal way. And so any results that we found, you could think, well, you know, this, is, this could be the math games or it could be uh, uh, just games. Uh, and, and so what we did to, to, to have an active control is we introduced uh, a sort of social emotional learning curriculum uh, that was uh, uh, very closely modeled on the math game in terms of the, the gameplay and the rules, but focused on, on, on social skills. And what we find is that uh, the first thing that is very important is that even though kids have never played any games like this before, they learn to play as quickly and as effectively as children in the U.S. And when I say in the U.S., it's Cambridge children who are mostly children of postdocs and assistant professors. And they played as enthusiastically. Poor Indian children, very much like rich, highly educated uh, children of highly educated parents in Cambridge, have an intuitive graph and an interest in number and geometry. Uh, we also found immediate effect, like, like in the um, previous study, immediate effect uh, on the non-symbolic uh, math games. So the kids who, this is the difference between uh, each of the treatment, the math game and the social games and the control. And you can see a very large uh, point for standard deviation impact on people's learning ma mathematics in the math games. Smaller effect in the social games, which is probably, uh, and then this and this are different, showing that this is an effect of teaching math, not just playing. Secondly, at end line two and at end line three, 18 months later, we find that these uh, non-symbolic math games are durable. They don't diminish over time, which is pretty unique because in every uh, single experiment I did on education, you find this strong decay over time, but we don't find any. That's the good news. The bad news on the other end is that uh, we don't find any impact on uh, um, uh, 
formal math skills uh, once the kids have reached school. So when they were still in preschools, where they were learning these this, this skills, recognizing numbers, we find some improvement of the mass of the mass game kid relative to the control kid and to the social game kids. But once they reach school, grade one and grade two, uh, we don't find any impact anymore. So although the math games originally enhanced the math language and symbols used in preschools. Uh, they did not uh, enhance children's learning on symbolic math in primary school. So that's the first point I wanted to make, which is uh, the school seems to be have not been able to leverage uh, the extra sort of leg up that these children were given when they arrived. And one of the reasons is that they, uh, they, they teach essentially by rote, they teach mathematics a bit like poetry, uh, grade one kids are made to learn multiplication tables and, you know, whether or not you understand math or not, it's pretty much irrelevant to your ability to recite multiplication table. So that's the first point. The second point uh, is now concerning adolescents. So there what we did is that, so uh, first in Kolkata, then in Delhi, we visited markets where you're seeing these uh, young teenagers selling uh, vegetables uh, or foods and uh, they are very impressive to watch because they, you can give them anything and they give you your change and they, they, it's pretty complicated the calculation they have to do. Uh, so we always had been fascinated by that. So we conducted a study where we sent um, uh, interviewers as decoys uh, to buy our uh, produce. Uh, they had to buy two pieces of things, so for example eggplant and tomatoes. And then, uh, so these things had different prices, they bought uh, uh, unusual quantities. Uh, so you had to do the multiplication, then the addition, and then they gave a large amount of money, so the kids had to do the correct subtraction. All of that, the kids mostly do in, in their head. We've done that, we did that three times uh, in the same market day with three different pairs of decoys. And then we invited the child uh, to, to do some, you know, to do some math exercises with us. If their parents agreed, most of them did agree. So we have also their uh, assessment on school arithmetic using the, the ASER work, ASER uh, study, uh, the ASER tool, as well as uh, a bunch of other problems, uh, uh, some of them more abstract, some of them more concrete, uh, some of them easier to round, some of them not easy to round. And what do we find? Uh, so, and in addition, in Delhi, we did the same thing in reverse, which is we went to schools and we set up the simulated market. You can see the kids uh, selling all sorts of vegetables. And we played a market game where we gave them money and then they had to, uh, uh, and bought some vegetable from them and they had to give us a chance. What do we find? Well, the first thing is confirming this intuitive idea that we had, which is uh, working children are extraordinarily good at doing this complicated calculation. In the decoy study, uh, mostly they are above 90%, 95% accuracy. Uh, much better than the daily school children on similar kind of market-like problems. So they are indeed very good at uh, running these math problems. Secondly, it's not because they know everything by heart for the things that they sell. Uh, it's, also, it's because they are able to, they're also able to do slightly different problems. Um, so what we did for that is we gave them hypothetical transaction, varying the prices, varying the units, varying the goods. And so the more things you vary, the, the more difficult it becomes. You can see that in Delhi. But on average, they still do very, very well on these calculations that are not about their own uh, produce and not about the prices they're used to. So it's not that they know everything by heart. And then, you know, for the tomatoes, they have uh, like a Rolodex in their head of how much it should be costing. However, they really struggle with school mathematics. So we, when we administer the, 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 the ASER test to them, uh, we find, uh, uh, for example, in Delhi, 15% of them at the division level, so able to do a division, or, uh, and, and therefore pr um, also subtraction and presumably the, 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 the other things. 51% of them are at the subtraction level. 91% are able to do uh, to recognize a double digit number and 99 single digit number. So they can recognize numbers, but they are not very good at manipulating them. 
uh, uh, when they are given to them in the form of this kind of school math problem. So why is that? Well, primarily uh, what trips them, so it's not the written form, most of them can recognize numbers, and when they do the problem orally, they have issues as well. If I tell them orally or in written form, uh, it's equally difficult for them to do 52 minus 24. On the other hand, if I ask them to do 52 pens versus uh, minus 24 pens, that's much easier. So uh, operations that are presented as concrete, what we call anchored here, uh, leads to much greater uh, performance than operations that are presented in an abstract way. So it seems that uh, the abstract presentation trips them up. Basically, what it gets, it, it leads them to, to kind of engage their school taught curriculum uh, that they haven't fully mastered and don't do it very well. Even though they, 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 they do answer something very basic about uh, the mathematic problems, which is the, the base 10 uh, structure of the arithmetic. Because when we give them problems that can be easily rounded, for example, 29 minus uh, 12, they do much better on these problems by doing 30 minus 12 and then adding back, uh, subtracting back 1, uh, uh, even though they are not given the strategy. So they understand that the, the, something very fundamental about the base 10 structure and how to exploit it. But uh, when they're faced with an abstract mathematical problem, they, uh, they, they get lost. Now, if we are looking at the students, uh, uh, the, the students who are in school today, they, uh, they write down a lot of things. As you can see, this is a sample of their work for the simulated problem. Uh, they take a long time to answer the question. They don't recognize uh, or leverage their existing knowledge, abstract or concrete. They don't know how to use the rounding system. So what this means is really deeper than the schools not teaching very much. First of all, they don't recognize or leverage existing knowledge. So this is what we found uh, among the preschool mathematicians or the, or the uh, market mathematicians. And then what little the schools teach is really useless for life because these kids in Delhi who actually are pretty good at doing the math problems are completely unable to exploit it or to do anything concrete in their life. So that's basically uh, the state of school. So it is much worse than not teaching. It's not recognizing that there is knowledge out there and it's not teaching and little, little you are teaching, not connecting it to what kids need to know. Uh, let me stop here uh, uh, before we, I go into some explanations and uh, pose for questions. Um, so there's a question from Naveed Hussain. Um, he's asking about the statement earlier, um, when schools are nearer, people go to schools. Uh, yep. and how it doesn't um, apply, for example, to two districts uh, in the northern part of Pakistan. For example, in one district, there's 268 schools, but the literacy rate is less than 50%. And in another district, there's only 34 schools, but the literacy rate um, is more like 95%. Does this mean that along with school infrastructure, there's a dire need of social mobilization for enrolling in schools? I'm sure this is correct for these two places, but uh, uh, on average, uh, it, uh, my statement was more that on average, having more schools lead to more schooling. I also agree that it's probably not the only thing that is needed, uh, both for you know uh, social mobilization and for both for enrollment and for and for um, uh, and for actually you know lobbying for school quality. I will say though that the the, the question of it, it is now very very the situation of the one district in Pakistan that has a lot of schools and and not very many kids in the school is pretty unique. That uh, uh, I, I, I did show you the data where enrollment rates in schools are are are, are very very large. Partly because of, as a result of large investment in school infrastructure over the, the last several decades, as well as uh, the mobilization. Um, we have a second question from Swasti from the Terry School in New Delhi. Uh, is there any evidence of the neighborhood effect on school attendance and overall learning outcome of students? Uh, by, uh, if by neighborhood you mean peer effect, that is like what other people do, do you do the same? Uh, I, I don't. I can't pinpoint in my head a particular uh, um, 
a study that looks specifically at that, although that looks plausible to me, and that could also explain, uh, you know, that's related to the previous question. Um, and then we'll take one last question for this round um, from Marine uh, Jouvet. Is there any data to show correlation between low level of school learning for the kids and the attendance or presence of the teacher themselves, especially yeah. in rural areas? Yeah. Yes. Uh, there is. Uh, so this is going to be, you're going to spend much more time on that in the in the future uh, lectures uh, when we look at teacher incentives. But uh, we did a study, I did a study on providing incentives for teachers just to show up in schools and uh, with Rima Hanna and Stephen Ryan and we do find uh, impact on uh, on children learning. But it's not, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll be talking about that uh, uh, much more also in the rest of this lecture. Um, so we can leave it to those questions for now. Okay, excellent. So, so I think, I, I hope I have persuaded you that there is an issue in schools, uh, in developing countries, uh, uh, an issue of learning quality, an issue of not leveraging existing knowledge, an issue of not teaching something that's useful for life. Uh, so what's the problem? So, let me start by what a poem is not, in my opinion, uh, based on the research that I've read. Um, the first one, the first thing you hear sometimes, uh, there is a more, uh, is, is that it's, it's about, it's because of the kids. Uh, for whatever reason, kids can't learn, and therefore they're not learning. So I don't think that's that. Uh, another thing that I th we often hear, is that it's all about resources in the school and in particular teacher salaries, teachers are underpaid. And the third thing that I also think it is not, is or not primarily, although I just gave you an example of, of teacher incentive mattering, is, uh, in, uh, is t incentives for teachers to do the job, at least the job as teachers understand it. So let me discuss uh, uh, the, the, the each point in turn. The first one is that uh, we know is is it the kid the, the fault of the kids? So you have the the, the teacher's way often of presenting it, uh, which is oh the kids don't want to learn or the parents don't want them to learn or there is no interest, etc. That's not a very uh, um, that's something you hear sometimes from children from teachers. A more politically correct way to to say that is one that was expressed, for example, by Bill Gates who uh, motivated a big nutrition children program for kids in India and in saying, well, the kids cannot learn because they don't get proper nutrition and therefore they cannot learn. Uh, but if it were true, uh, then we would not find that the preschool mathematicians were, you know, at an age where nutrition should be mattering a lot, uh, would be uh, able to do the math games. And in fact, we find that the preschool mathematician have the same non-symbolic abilities in India as is typically found in US studies of very well nourished privileged children. Moreover, in our studies, uh, we found exactly the same correlation between current and su subsequent symbolic skills and non-symbolic skills are in the US. So we find in our, uh, in, in this setting that the kids who, you know, tend to do well on the, on those non-symbolic skills do also better in, in symbolic skills like in the US. So this, the, the, the by uh, uh, four or five, uh, the kids are just equally competent and ready for learning, uh, but um, as the as the U.S. kids, so it can't be that it's about nutrition, or the nutrition would be uh, a little bit later. Now going to the teacher salaries, so it it is uh, it it might come. Teachers in most developing countries are highly paid relative. Uh, to other people in the population. Uh, this is not true for teachers in, in many developed countries, not true in France, for example, where teachers are, are extremely poorly paid uh, and find themselves at the bottom of the distribution of income. So I'm not saying there is never a, a teacher salary problem anywhere in the world. I actually think there is one in France, for example. But in India, for example, teachers, like a lot of civil servants, tend to be uh, a very, very highly paid. Uh, they tend to be, the, the teacher salaries are also much higher in the public uh, sector than cheap private schools. And yet, performance in private schools is, is um, at least as good as it is in, in, in public schools. So that means they are reaching the same level of learning or more with, with much lower teacher salaries. 
Non-permanent teachers who are paid a fraction of a regular teacher salary tend to be more effective. We have evidence of that both in India, in Kenya, and in other countries. And finally, there is an experiment uh, uh, in Indonesia that just uh, uh, cut down, the, that doubled the teacher salaries uh, uh, and led to no increase in teacher performance. Uh, so it is unlikely that teacher salaries would do it uh, uh, per se. Uh, they, uh, the, we're going to spend much more time on that. You're going to spend much more time on that in the next few lectures. But the, there is a, a number of randomized experiments on, uh, on teachers, uh, on, on resources in school more generally, not just teacher salaries, because this is kind of the birth of randomized experiment, what it was. And uh, we find no impact, therefore, these studies find no impact on cutting class size if there is no other change in pedagogy uh, of uh, various resources like uh, computers, books, etc. No, let me not say computer. Computers tend to be useful if they are used in a specific way. Uh, but if the resources are just added to what already exists, from textbooks to flip charts to anything, that doesn't seem to be making a difference. So it's not just the resources. Finally, sort of the preferred explanation of a lot of economists, because economists like to think in terms of incentives, is that uh, uh, teach, it's teacher incentives that, that, that does it. In fact, uh, you're going to spend a lot of time on teacher incentives, and there is evidence that directing incentives to specific activities does help. For example, we already discussed in response to a question, my work in India showing that when teachers are given incentives to attend, they attend more and their kids scored better at an endline test. Uh, given uh, uh, children, a teacher's incentive based on their children's test scores leads to an increase in, in, in test scores, at least in some setting. However, you would think if it was all about incentive, the litmus test would be private schools, since they survive based on the parent satisfaction, so they definitely have an incentive uh, to do well uh, by the parents. Uh, and indeed, the assertors consistently find that children going to private schools do better in terms of test scores than children uh, who go to government schools. But it could be due to selection of children. And in fact, in a large randomized controlled trial that you're going to hear much more about in future, uh, uh, the, the private schools tend to teach math and Telugu less well, although they teach Hindi and English. So we really have to... Uh, um, uh, not just say, oh, it's private, it's, it's the incentives that are poor, because uh, when you give people, the, the schools, the highest powered incentives, they move and they change their, what they do, but they change what they do in a direction of, uh, that is a, a bit ambiguous in terms of uh, whether it's good or bad for children and not like just ultimately moving the frontier up by a lot. So we'll get back to that because uh, in the private school, we have to assume the response to parental demand. And therefore, that's going to give us some idea of what the parental demand uh, might be here. So if the kids can learn and teachers do teach, uh, could the problem be that teachers are just not teaching the right thing? And, and that is actually true both in, in private school and in, in public school. And that links to something that I've been calling the tyranny of the curriculum, which is no matter what children can do, teachers cannot afford not to complete the curriculum. And that is something that you find uh, across the world, in particular in former colonies, where the uh, curricula have, you know, are inspired by uh, the old system, where the, the schools had been initially created to, uh, to serve a, a small elite of uh, educated clerk that would support the colonial regime. So the curriculum was elitist from the get-go, and then it was expanded to a larger number of kids staying just, just as elitist. Um, give you an example for, for Haryana. So this is grade four curriculum. Uh, so in October, you have to understand carts and wheels. You have to understand the circle using ban bangles, ropes, etc. Understanding the concept of a radius. Um, you start with fraction, half, quarter, three fourths, etc. In November, you have to understand. You start doing algorithm and patterns, uh, patterns with addition, uh, tilings. Then you. Uh, you need to know your uh, uh, table of multiplication up to 15. I hope you guys are all uh, up to date with your uh, 
uh, a table of 13 because I'm not. Um, start with division, then you do an assessment, then you understand heavier, you under start understanding volumes, then you understand how to uh, uh, measure a perimeter of regular and irregular figures and area of regular and uh, regular pictures. And by now, we are only in January of grade four. So this is like a crazy curriculum that is not the, the things that the kids are taught uh, in, in, um, in schools in France or, or in the US. Um, at least, I mean, I don't know if it's crazy, but let's say it's aspirational. Uh, and it's not, of course, uh, just an Indian problem. We have the same problem in Kenya. And I mentioned from France before, I think France also has a little bit of that, uh, trying to get rid of it slowly, but uh, quite uh, elitist curriculum. In comparison to Finland, for example, where kids do not learn to, to read until age seven, and uh, where there is a huge emphasis on success in primary grade, uh, on, on, on reading, uh, and Finland is the country in Europe, in fact, in the, US, in the OECD, that has the, the, the best test scores at the primary level. So this is not a proof of, of that, but this is a sign that this is not just this kind of elitism weighing of test scores, um, is, is a kind of a, a worldwide phenomenon that, that correlates with success. So let me stop here for a minute if people have questions. Um, okay, so this is not really a question, but there's quite a few people commenting in terms of examples from their countries, Ethiopia, Nigeria, for example, where teachers are not highly paid. Um, and they're just wondering, like, what the, the, is it the comparison to other sectors that shows that? Yeah, so yeah. so what you have to think of what highly paid means is, is, you know, in a country, of course, you cannot pay the teachers in Ethiopia the same as they are paid in the U.S. Uh, the question is where people, where teachers stand in the in the um, relative to the rest of the of the salary level in the population, and uh, I don't know the situation of every single country, but I know many countries, and in in general, in particular, public school teachers tend to be uh, uh, um, tend to be at a much higher percentile level of the country uh, distribution uh, in poor countries than they are in rich countries. And that's true for civil servants in general, who get a, a premium to be a civil servant, as uh, Ben Olken, Roini Pandey, and Fred Finan have shown, that uh, 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 is much larger in, in developed countries. And the, the result of that, actually, is that those are children who are highly, those are jobs who, who are highly uh, desirable, highly desired. I have a, a, a project in Ghana where we where uh, we gave secondary schools to children to attend uh, a scholarship, secondary school scholarship to kids. And uh, the, the most de desirable outcome for them is to get a job as a teacher. And in fact, they wait uh, for a very long time till they can get a, a spot in the teacher college in order to get those jobs. And then once they get those jobs, they, they suddenly get uh, much, much more comfortable financially than, 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 than they came from. So I think that's actually a reasonably a general uh, phenomenon, but there might be exceptions that I don't know about. Um, there's another question from Priscilla Hamukwala. Um, in your experiments, has there been any systematic gender differences in math skills? Um, if so, uh, are there any particular factors that contribute to that? Uh, at, the, at the kids' level, uh, for small kids, no. Uh, you find uh, girls and boys doing just as well. Uh, for the uh, kids in markets, they're almost all boys, so there was no uh, girls to, to look at. Um, and then we have a couple of questions about class size and how that affects learning outcomes. Uh, it, 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 surprisingly, unless it leads to changes in pedagogy, it, it doesn't, or it doesn't tend to have a large effect in developing countries, contrary to what we find in richer countries. So, for example, in Kenya, we had an experiment where we divided class size in two, uh, and there was no impact if nothing else was changed, if it was a regular teacher and, uh, uh, and there was no uh, grouping of kids by, by ability or achievement. Uh, and one last question on the learning level, did you look at the role of language? Does it make a difference if uh, students learn using their mother tongue as a medium of instruction? Uh, 
So I haven't done studies like that, but uh, there, there, there are numbers uh, of uh, studies that look at the uh, medium of instruction. Uh, I, th I think the, the, the results tend to be, tend to find that for early grades, uh, this is uh, uh, easier for children if, uh, and, they, and they learn more if the instruction is there in their own language. And that's going to relate to some of the things I'm going to talk just now. I mean, that's in some sense that relates to what I'm already doing, which is that, uh, for example, in Kenya, kids are nominally taught in English, uh, which for many children is uh, their, their third language after their own, you know, their own local language and then Swahili. So this is, um, so in one of the very early randomized experiments by Michael Kramer, he gave textbooks which were in English and these textbooks had no impact whatsoever. And one of the reasons is that they were in English that most kids can't even read. Um, we can leave it at those questions for now. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so. Um, so that's the problem. Is uh, uh, if if that indeed, indeed is the problem, uh, the uh, that teaching is not at the right level, that the curriculum uh, leaves many children behind, that children that teachers feel that it is their job to teach the curriculum. So in many countries, it actually is their job. It is part of their job description to complete the curriculum. While it might not be part of their description to make sure that any children actually reach there. Um, that uh, means that uh, if children start uh, losing track early on, say because they reach uh, uh, grade three, for example, without knowing to, to read yet, nobody's going to teach them to read now because now by grade three, things are um, already established and you are supposed to be you know, learning to, to do other things with your reading. And kids can be hopelessly lost uh, forever and will not learn to read and will not learn other things. Um, and that's kind of what we are uh, 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 finding here. If that's the problem, then it means that um, one can really make uh, significant gains in schools by uh, um, abandoning a, a uniform curriculum uh, that's based on age with automatic promotion, as we discussed earlier, uh, in favor of a system that where, we, uh, where you have teaching at the right level, so that's TAL, uh, where kids are, are regularly assessed uh, using very simple tools. Then they are grouped by homogeneous le learning level in groups. And then they, they, they start by uh, getting foundational skills appropriate to the level uh, that where they are now. And then kids are constantly reassessed and moved to the level as they progress. This is a program that was, uh, um, you know, the brainchild of, of of Pratham, which was created by Dr. Madhav Chavan, uh, quickly joined by Dr. Rukmini Banaji, uh, initially with UNICEF funding in Bombay and then moving to now uh, serving millions of children all over the, the countries and uh, is aiming in the rest of the world as well. Pranav has long been a, a partner of, uh, of JPAL and, 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 and my group. Uh, so we've had a chance to evaluate uh, using randomized evaluation several iterations of, uh, of the Pratam model. And here is the timeline of the project. So first of all, we were able to, to directly evaluate the program in urban areas in 21-23. Then in, uh, so it's a kind of teaching the ancestor of the teaching at the right level program. Then uh, in um, rural areas in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, and then in a summer camp in Bihar, and then in, in school teacher led uh, learning improvement, and then a program in Ghana that was replicating some of the con some of the models of, of uh, tested here, tested in 2005-2006, and then uh, uh, another teacher led model in 2012-2013, and then finally and other learning camps where, which is more of a taking over of the schools for a period of time in 2013-2014. So I show you this long timeline to explain what, what uh, how it takes a long time to go from long time and a lot of iteration to go from a proof of concept, which probably we had in 21-23 with the evaluation of the Balsaki program, to a program that uh, can be scaled up both in India and the rest of the world. Uh, so what we uh, 
uh, what we we find when we have part-time staff or volunteer in school is huge huge gains and this is the last program over here uh, and um, uh, sorry let me just go back to the timeline and explain to you so we first found big gains of the program both in rural and urban areas and then Pratem got involved in the scale up of this program through government partnership and we were interested in testing the uh, scale up version. One possibility of the scale up are summer camps where the government teacher teach but uh, outside of their normal curriculum approach. One possible approach is to teach the teachers to implement these strategies uh, inside the schools itself. There are in principle benefits and drawbacks of both uh, methods. Uh, the benefits of the uh, in-school model is that the kids are already there, so you might as well uh, teach them when they are there. Whereas in summer schools, you have to kind of hunt for them. They are not very, they are not really necessarily all coming. In fact, many of them do not come. The disadvantage, however, is that in the school, in the model that where teachers try to teach inside the schools, it competes with their other activities. And in fact, what we found uh, in our first 2008-2010 experiment is that uh, the, the, the summer school model worked very well, showing that the, key, the, the teachers are perfectly able to teach when it's the only thing they have to do, even though they have to chase the children. But the in-school model didn't work at all, partly because the teacher just didn't implement it. And why didn't they implement it? Well, we conducted a, a, a detailed a focus group with them and they told us, look, I really like your activities, but I have to complete my curriculum. I have no choice. So that led to a rethinking about how to make the program work. Um, and um, basically the idea is that you either have, if it's going to be run by teachers, two things have to happen. First of all, they have to really understand that this is their job, that this is not something they have to do on the side, that the government really wants them uh, to successfully implement the program. Uh, and second of all, they have to be given some space in the school day or the school years to do it. So this is what we tried in Haryana, but with two changes on the program. One is to have the, the cadre of inspectors to start by training themselves and trying themselves so that they could be effectively, these are the supervisors of the teachers, convey that this is what the teacher should be doing and that they can do it and how to do it. And secondly, to create a space in the day so that it was a special hour that was entirely devoted to these activities and nothing else could be done there. Uh, the other possibility is to just, in, and in settings where schools are very dysfunctional, works very well, is to just have pretem staff go into the schools and run learning camps. And both of these models are extraordinarily effective. Given that, it took some time to arrive at programs that can be scaled up, uh, and now they are being scaled up. Teaching at the right level today reached millions of children, or reached millions of children before the pandemic in India and in, Af in India and is now uh, spreading in several countries in Africa under Pratam leadership, uh, which is a great example of uh, an innovation spreading from south to, from south, to south. Um, so now to uh, uh, getting, we are getting closer to a, a, a conclusion, especially if we want to give some time uh, to, for questions. So let me think about so this, the success of Pratam and the success of the teaching at the right level is both instrumental uh, and it also tells us that, um, uh, meaning that it leads to a good policies that can be scaled up in, in other places and hopefully will improve learning level. But it only improves learning level to some extent. And in particular, one of the things that we struggled with in uh, the, um, the scale up of the program, both in India with the teachers, for example, and sometimes with policymakers, is uh, a certain resistance to uh, sort of waste time, in a way, from the curriculum to go back to the basics in grade three and four. So the idea that you would you know, go back to teaching, uh, reading, and, and, and very simple math to kids in three and four, people still you know, implicitly or explicitly consider that it's a bit of a waste of time and that they, should be, they don't have time and should really be working on the curriculum. So these are really constant persuasion efforts. 
and you arrive to a, you know, you succeed to an extent and that's good, but you might ask yourself, like, can, can more be done to fix uh, primary education? So one radical solution is to just give up on the schools. Um, Pratham's mission originally was every child in school. Then they added an every child in school and learning. Then they added every child in school and learning well. And sometimes now when you talk to Madhav Chaval, he's wondering whether they need every child in school even, and whether the learning should be uh, outside of schools. And in fact, uh, there are many de uh, effort now, and uh, this was accelerated with the pandemic, of um, uh, uh, getting learning to the kids outside of the schools without uh, trying to, to, to be mediated by the school. Uh, and one thing that has really helped there is the advent of digital technologies, uh, cheap tablets that kids have, video content that be given to the schools. Um, you're going to spend some time uh, uh, with Kartik discussing uh, the, the great potential of these digital uh, uh, technologies, in particular in adapting the level, in sort of me mechanically, automatically adapting uh, the, the exercises to the level of the kids, so getting sort of uh, embedded teaching at the right level. Um, so this is very satisfying because, for example, with the, the, the studies of, of this program MindSpark, a software program used in tutoring lessons, led to really, really large impact in a way that is in principle quite sustainable because this is done outside of the school using, uh, using uh, 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 computers so that can be supervised with by pretty much anybody. The computers and tablets are now extremely cheap. The software can you know, is, is a huge fixed cost. The marginal cost is essentially zero. Uh, so that, you know, you can really make great progress. The issue is that schools are, uh, continue to have the monopoly to test and to legitimate knowledge. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, the fundamental approach with, with giving up on the schools is that uh, um, kids go to school Parents have, uh, have, agreed, <laughs> have agreed to do that. 97% of kids are enrolled. Parents recognize the le legitimacy of the school system. Anything else requires them uh, to, uh, requires to convince them to show up. Uh, so our first, the first Red India program the, the, uh, was, or the, not the Balsaki program that was tested in Gujarat, but the second one in rural areas was tested out of school. So kids had to come to, to special camps out of school for a couple of hours a day. And there were absolutely spectacular effects on very few kids. So the average effect for the community were very positive, but it was driven by the fact that uh, the kids who went really benefited from it. So you think that's kind of a bit of a waste uh, where you have, you know, 100% of the kids in school you would like to find something that works for them. Uh, another issue that you're going to find in the, uh, in the study of the MindSpark, uh, which you'll see a bit later, is that at the end of the day, um, the, the, the test scores, although they were enormous, didn't bring the kids to grade level and therefore didn't really uh, impress parents that it could help with, set, with passing exams. And, and there was very low willingness to pay uh, for the program by parents once it was not free anymore. And that is, uh, uh, that's an issue. I'm going to uh, uh, not spend too much time on that because you're going to see it with Kartik. Uh, but there was really this huge contrast between huge gains uh, here, where you really have, a, 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 here are the gains, tremendous gains, 0 0.6 standard, 0 0.67 standard deviation. In math, 0 0.44 in, in, in Hindi, it's like spectacular. But no gain on school exams. And therefore, no parent interest and the program had to stop. So, and the problem is there, it's very related to what happened in the private schools uh, and why the, 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 the private schools don't have like a, 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 an ambiguous positive impact, uh, even though they are cheaper for what they deliver, which is already good in, in and of itself, is that parents continue to buy into the obsession of elitism. The schools uh, for many parents is valuable for the possibilities it open up. Uh, for, and that's why in the private schools you see impact on English and Hindi 
and not on Telugu, the local language. Uh, in, in, in Ghana, uh, so it should be Ghana, in Ghana we collected uh, bef before a scholarship, before giving scholarships to kids to attend secondary school, we gave, uh, 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 we administered a baseline survey where we asked kids and their parents what they, uh, what they thought the returns to education were. And parents had tremendous hope for secondary school education. They thought that the, 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 income, the income gain would be of the order of 200, 300%, mainly because kids would be able to become teachers and earn a lot of money once they do that. In fact, very few kids became teachers, so they increased their, their, uh, there was not such a large increase in, in, the, in the income of the kids. Many go other good things happened. Uh, but these good things doesn't seem to be particularly what the parents uh, value. So, if uh, what the parents value is mainly the legitimation process that comes with the school, then it seems really, really important to continue working with the school, uh, even though it's hard. <laughs> so, we have to find uh, ways to engage with the school system. Uh, so if you have to engage with the school system, then given that the problem is this curriculum is too hard, you could say, well, it's very simple, we just have to change the curriculum. And, and that remains, I think, uh, the holy grail for me is something that really one should work on. Unfortunately, it's not going to be easy. There is tremendous opposition from the education world. In many settings, we go in some sense the other way. Uh, uh, where the curriculum is not uh, uh, simplified. Uh, with one exception, uh, which is the government of Delhi, which, uh, which decide to explicitly decide that they won't finish the curriculum in Delhi. They started to track kids uh, to make sure that, they, that they, had, they understood something. And it led to large gains in test scores uh, before the pandemic. In fact, so much so that the municipal schools in Delhi outperformed for the first time ever the private school at the school finishing exam. So it seems to me that there they had kind of the, the, the that's the one kind of political decision, uh, but it's a very special government, uh, um, which is sort of, uh, in terms of its ideology, which is both a sort of populist in a good sense, in terms of like making sure that the services serve the people. And uh, that's, that has remained a relatively uh, isolated example. Uh, so it's, we still want to continue working on that, but that's hard. Uh, and that's not really something economists have much to say about, unfortunately. They're not the people who are kind of listened to on this subject. So you can't give up on the schools because that's where the kids are. You can't reform them wholesale because they are not willing to do that. Uh, so what you could work on the margins. Uh, some part of the systems are, are much more open than the schools themselves. Uh, one margin is tutoring. So many kids are involved in tutoring on top of being in school. This is widespread around the world where kids go to school and then they, they, they attend tutoring and whatever learning is happening is happening during their tutoring session. And there, of course, it's like a free for all. So the tutoring uh, sessions is where, for example, you could have computers that, that teach kids better. This is what was tried with the MindSpark program. Another margin is completely different schools. So in, in India, in Uttar Pradesh, schools don't teach anything. But on the other hand, the good thing is they are happy to be replaced by anybody. So that creates a margin. Another place is preschool, uh, where uh, uh, there is not much of a view yet of what needs to be done. And so this is uh, uh, an area where uh, there is uh, uh, a lot of possibilities to propose something that's on good quality so that kids are actually, even the poorest kids, uh, arrive in school just as ready uh, for what the school system is going to, going to throw, throw at them. And therefore, they don't get lost at the beginning and don't get lost very early on. Even the early grades, grade one and two, uh, might still be fine because uh, the curriculum there is still, uh, you know, axed on the very basic things, reading, writing, you know, basic numeracy. And therefore, all the activities that can be proposed to help kids to learn to read and write are actually very well received by teachers because they see this as a, achieving, helping them to achieve what they want to achieve anyway, which is to teach the curriculum. So there is a whole spectrum of early years between grade three and uh, uh, between the age of three and the age of seven or eight which is actually, uh, which is a, a very open 
uh, margin where uh, the, the, the advances from cognitive science, uh, the, the experiments coming from the field uh, can be kind of aggregated into something that, uh, that would work uh, well. And the summers are another margin, they are very long, kids learn, a, you know, lose a lot. Um, so here's an example of, uh, of doing that. Uh, I, you remember my, the first experiment I showed you about a uh, preschool mathematician that was successful in teaching kids to, uh, in teaching kids to uh, intuitive mathematics, but not successful to, uh, um, was not leveraged by the schools. So what we decided to do uh, in a second experiment is to still continue to work in preschools, but add a, a formal uh, component to it, so symbolic games. And so now we compare uh, conditions where we are teaching only non-symbolic math to a condition where we are teaching symbolic math. Uh, and then a condition where, so non-symbolic only, symbolic only, mixed and no treatment. And what we find here is that when you have mixed, you're learning just as much uh, uh, in, by end line one, by end line two, and by end line three, um, in terms of non-symbolic skills. And then in terms of symbolic skills, you are learning more. And in fact, it, pers it, it continues even uh, one and a half year later, the gain in symbolic skills is still there uh, in the mixed game. So it seems that by combining in the same duration of time, non-symbolic and symbolic games, you don't lose anything on the non-symbolic learning and you gain something on the symbolic learning. So kids are actually learning, uh, uh, learning better once they are in school. Uh, so uh, armed with this model, what did we do? Well, we tried to put in place a scalable model that could be played with kids uh, in, in, with a lot of autonomy after an initial introduction by the teachers uh, in those early years in government schools uh, with for kindergarten and grade one teachers. Um, the cards emphasize the base 10 structure of the number system and the equivalence between 1, 10 and 10, 10, 1 allowing, you know, learn, teaching people to, teaching kids to, um, to learn that we share fundamental skill in grade one. Uh, the kids were able to play alone. Uh, they played competitively across groups. They understand the, the games very well. And what we find here is that that led to a strong impact on symboling math outcomes, both for kindergarten and for grade one uh, students. So this was uh, a very good uh, result, and it suggests that it's uh, uh, you know something that we are now working on scaling it up, uh, both in in both directly through the schools and then through non-government actors uh, in many states um, to kind of make the kids ready for whatever uh, is ready for them by working in that in that uh, kindergarten grade one uh, uh, margin. Uh, the only worry with that, so I think this is hugely promising and that's kind of the area where I spent most of my time on now. The only worry is that the, the, the temptation to close this margin as it expands. So whenever you have, you know, the reason why the margin is open is, is to some extent because nobody has paid attention uh, yet. But once people, you know, everyone starts realizing that, oh, preschool is important, the worry is that you start setting up a curriculum for preschools and you... Uh, regulate it away, and then you, you might suddenly find yourself with the same problems. Uh, so what's the ultimate strategy? Uh, I would say it's patience. Uh, it's realizing that there is not going to be a silver bullet, ultimately. That we will need to continue to engage with the school system as it is, however frustrating. The good thing is we exactly know what needs to be done. That when it's possible to teach at the, you know, prepare the kids, number one, teach them at the right level once they arrive, number two. Um, the, so the, the challenge now is more of a political economy organizational problem is to exploit all the existing wages and pry open new ones at every opportunity. Uh, I think the pandemic actually could be an opportunity or could be a complete disaster. Uh, it could be an opportunity if, if, if the school system realizes that the kids are coming back with, trem with even more uh, differences in their, uh, in their levels. It could be a disaster if they don't and they continue to try to shove the curriculum to them. Uh, 
but any of this effort leads to real gains, uh, even if they don't lead to a revolution, and these gains are multiplied by millions and millions of, of children. So I'm going to stop here and, and, and take questions now for the, for the rest of the talk. Anyway. We have a question from Baraj Bisht. Could you talk a little bit more about examples um, where the tyranny of curriculum does not exist or is not as severe? For instance, you mentioned Finland. How do they structure their curriculum? Basically, are there any best practices around this problem? Yeah, so Finland is a great example of a no tyranny of the curriculum. Uh, it's uh, 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 so kids uh, stay in kindergarten until they're seven. Uh, they start learning to read only at age seven, uh, and they, uh, therefore most of them are ready. That's number one. Number two, uh, when uh, kids, uh, there is a software they're using uh, in every, in all of the schools uh, to teach. Uh, uh, early reading that was originally developed for kids with dyslexia and now is used for all the kids, which is uh, uh, extraordinarily progressive, uh, starts uh, from really the basics of, of, of phonics and uh, that kids do um, every day for a while and then that help the kids progress at their own level because it's, it, you know, kind of move them to the next step once they're already ready for it. So constant reinforcement. Number three, uh, Finland uh, has a, a lot of uh, human resources in the school. Uh, many people who are available to provide uh, individual level of attention to kids in small groups by level and so on. Um, can you talk, uh, this is a question from Sakina Shibuya. Can you talk a bit more about changing the minds of education bureaucrats? Presumably, you are going around them by supporting uh, non-governmental projects because it's too hard to change the curriculum itself. Is that right? Oh no, I spend most of my time trying to work with school systems for reasons that I uh, that I explained. That you know, the, being outside of schools, there there are not very you know, enough kids there. So I spend most of my time trying to to work through schools. Um, I'm not doing that alone. I'm doing that with local actors, in particular Pratam. But Pratam is ex mostly uh, acting uh, in very close tandem with the school systems, uh, both in India and elsewhere. And and the convincing is 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 interesting. It's complicated uh, because uh, this this idea that you basically there is the idea that if you uh, make the curriculum simpler, you are I don't know, disrespecting the children or not being, uh, or, or selling them something less good than what they are entitled to, and that the way in which you uh, uh, show that uh, you are, you are uh, you know, on the side of the children is by having this very ambitious curriculum and, and lofty plans. So there is no ill will, I don't think, but uh, uh, just a lack of understanding of how it uh, reflects to the reality on the ground. Then where we, where we get the most success uh, usually is when there is a local champion, for example, a district uh, education officer or a state, sometimes at the level of the state. But if it's, if it's at the level of the state, it needs to go back down to, to the district that can in then in turn uh, convince people, uh, you know, convince the bureaucracy, the, the school inspectors, etc. We've had, this is really, I think, the, the, the really fundamental shift that happened that shifted from the in-school model uh, of, of remedial learning to be unsuccessful to successful is when uh, we realized that we had to train the, the inspectors. And that the way now every program that Pratam does, they first get the bureaucrats to, and they train them and they send them to schools and they send them to try, etc. And then you have like... A, a, a force of people that's much more likely to actually uh, uh, implement the program. We have a question from Marielle Bedoya. Um, so you talked mainly, or you talked about the main problem of curriculum. If you had to weigh the contribution of all of the problems you sort of touched on, curriculum, teachers, infrastructure, health of students, incentives, etc. Um, to explain the learning gaps between developing and developed countries, what weight would you put to each? I think I made it pretty clear that uh, I don't think anything explains things as much as the curriculum. 
uh, it's the combination of the curriculum and the way that the, and the incentives that it gives, you know, down the line to everyone in the system. Um, a question from Garima Agarwal. Um, could a possible strategy for getting parents to support programs like MindSpark um, be spending some time helping kids do better on the formal school curriculum in addition to the treatment, i.e. teaching at the right level? Uh, anecdotally, this seems to be an informal solution many motivated teachers at public institutions use. So that's a great idea, but the problem is that you can't teach people nuclear physics until they know how to count. And uh, the, uh, the MindSpark system uh, doesn't uh, uh, stop the kids at the lower level, but it only makes them progress when they have the understanding that they need in order to, to move forward. And you couldn't reproduce that, uh, uh, sort of you would reproduce the same error of the, of the school curriculum if you said, well, fine, they, they, they don't yet know how to do uh, subtraction, but since they are in grade eight, it's absolutely essential that they can solve this very difficult uh, division problem. So I'm going to also try to teach them that algorithm. And the problem you have when you do that is that you have uh, this half-baked, half-understood algorithm that uh, confuse kids and this is exactly what we're seeing in the market math where you're trying to do that and the kids are unable to once you present things in the school format the kids are unable to do things that they actually know how to do um, so that's the danger of trying to kind of uh, skip ahead or something like that on top of uh, teaching the foundational skills. So the MindSpark system is set up to take the kids all the way where they need to be, but you need to start from where they are. And there is no time in like to, you know, in, in the sessions, uh, in the limited time in the session that it's left outside of the school day. Um, another question from Jose Pinilla. Um, are there any potential drawbacks to displacing the official curriculum? Do we have any evidence on long-term impacts of in-school implementation of teaching at the right level? Uh, that's a great question. No, so I doubt because uh, unless, you know, what we are seeing the result of the curriculum, I, I doubt that there are big drawbacks uh, because we are seeing the result of the curriculum now. Uh, I didn't show you uh, uh, some evidence that, um, for, for the learning of older kids, uh, the, um, from, me, from time to time, the, the ASSER report is on older kids, and then it teaches them some very simple kind of life questions, like, um, you know, if you have a, a packet of uh, a cleaning solution that's for uh, 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 20 liters, and then you need to do 40 liters, how many packets should you use? And, and, and Kids are terrible at these questions, even worse than, than at the formal math questions. And even the kids who can do the formal math can't do these problems. That's very, you know, echoes exactly what we found in the, in the uh, market math problems where the, the, the kids in school who could do the division couldn't do uh, the market math problems. They did them badly. And if even if they managed to do them, it took like them 20 minutes to to give people the change, which is of course not practical. So I, I don't think that the that what is being taught now is 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 particularly useful for people's uh, either at giving people the, the 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 foundational math that would allow them to go further, or the foundational reading abilities that would allow them to go further, or in teaching them skills that would be useful in their lives. So I don't, I don't see the drawback of uh, replacing that by actually doing something that did either of these two things. That said, uh, uh, to my knowledge, there haven't been long-term impact of, uh, of TAL programs. Another question from Pradeep Chaudhry. When you are connecting curriculum with learning, uh, with learning outcomes, is it about the curriculum and its design or the pressure on teachers in completing the curriculum? Yes, yeah, so that's the that's uh, that's both, but they go hand in hand. Uh, if you de if you had curriculum, but they were just suggestions, uh, it might be fine. But all of the pressure in the incentive system is on completing. For example, in in India, under the Right to Education Act, teachers are comp compelled by law to complete the curriculum. 
and in other systems, uh, for example, in Kenya, in, 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 in Ghana, in Tanzania, in Uganda, where there are school living exams, uh, uh, t- teachers are, and schools are ranked by how many kids manage to do well at the school living exam, which again is related to completing the curriculum and paying attention to the top of the class who has the ability to, to actually complete it. Um, we have a question from Ebenezer uh, Kondo, specifically about your research in Ghana. Um, have you done any validation studies to further support your initial findings? Currently in Ghana, a new curriculum has been introduced at the basic school level, but no accompanying textbooks for teachers to effectively deliver. What impacts do you envisage this could have on the quality of education in Ghana? Uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you refer to by validation study. Our, our, the study we did was uh, among secondary school kids, so much older children, when we, it was a randomized, people, kids were randomized in 2008 and given scholarships to attend secondary school. Um, and then we have been following them ever since. Uh, but we haven't done a second study uh, uh, doing the same thing again. So we just have this one cohort. Um, I, I don't. I, I, I've made a successful career not to make predictions uh, on what could happen when something does something. So I'm not going to predict what could be the impact of the program um, of uh, uh, of not having the textbooks that go with the new curriculum. But uh, one would think that it, it could be helpful to have some complement. A question from Hijab to here. Given the lag between research and policy implementation, are there strategies for schools to measure the existing knowledge post-pandemic and then alter curriculum plans accordingly? That's a great question. I really wish. Uh, uh, And uh, we've been trying to advocate in this direction. Uh, It doesn't seem very high on anybody's mind right now. As you know, one of the thing that is really striking this pandemic in developing countries is how the schools were not very high on anybody's mind. And to to rethink now how we are going to accompany kids who are coming with these very different experiences um, uh, would be pretty critical. And and I, I don't think it's happening on a very systematic basis right now. So we're one minute till the end of the lecture. Um, Esther, do you want to give any sort of last remarks um, before we close? Uh, nothing except for uh, thanking you uh, for joining us today. And I hope you will continue to attend. Uh, you have We have a wonderful set of uh, lecturers in store for you in this module. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, a next module on credit risk and insurance in, in a few weeks. So looking forward to seeing you all of seeing all of you there and I hope you enjoyed this lecture.